Is that right? Yeah. Uh, uh, bu I mean, B Bucky, this is why you're the GOAT. Like, tell me more. Are we overrating the class? Welcome into the NFL on Fox podcast. I am your host, Dave Hellman, and without fail, it's always something in the NFL. I don't know why we spend so much time coming up with schedules and, and budgets of what to talk about, topics to go through, when you can always count on the NFL to do the heavy lifting for you and give you some content. Blockbuster trade in the NFL on Wednesday, Stephon Diggs off to the Houston Texans. We're going to talk about that in a minute with none other than NFL analyst Bucky Brooks. In the meantime, while you're getting ready for that, maybe if you want to go follow the show, give us a follow on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, maybe give us a review, maybe give give yours truly a review if you wouldn't mind, or go follow us on social at NFL on Fox Pod. We deeply appreciate all of your help with our head coaching bracket here during March Madness. Maybe not the most surprising result, Andy Reid winning it, but a hell of a fun road to get there. So make sure you're doing all of that, keeping up with all of our social feeds as we lead you up to the NFL draft. But like I said, in the meantime, major, major news. Stephon Diggs traded from Buffalo to Houston. I was already going to talk to Bucky about this loaded NFL receivers class. We talked quarterback a week ago. We're now going to preview this very, very good draft class of wide receivers, which, hey, maybe the Buffalo Bills could stand to listen to this and get some insight into what to expect. So without further ado, a fun chat with Bucky Brooks about the Stephon Diggs trade, as well as a phenomenal class of rookie receivers coming into the league here in just a few weeks. Check it out. All right, Buck. We're on to talk draft again, like we did last week. We're going to preview receivers, which I mean, this it's a perfect, it is a perfect segue into talking receivers because we already had this scheduled. We already knew we were going to talk receivers. And then the Buffalo Bills trade Stephon Diggs to the Houston Texans on Wednesday morning, which just makes it that much more interesting. I'm just curious. I mean, it's, it's hard to say we're surprised, right? Because there's been whispers like this around Stefan Diggs and the Bills for a little while, but it is still interesting to me that Buffalo would pull the trigger on this, knowing that they're trying to keep a championship window open. <clears throat> so there are a couple of things in place. So we will talk about Stefan Diggs first, and I'll talk about the impact on Josh Allen. Stefan Diggs, great playmaker, great wide receiver, obviously a veteran receiver who knows how to get open. Um, I have a belief that when you have a young quarterback, you need to have an older established wide receiver because when you're trying to get the young quarterback to play with trust, to play with timing and anticipation, you got to make sure that the wide receiver is going to be where he needs to be. We saw Stefan Diggs help, I would say, elevate Josh Allen because Josh Allen was struggling. Stefan Diggs comes in, all of a sudden Josh Allen accuracy improves. He begins to throw the ball, play like a high-end player. You now take that same Stefan Diggs to training wheels. You now put him with C.J. Stroud to help C.J. Stroud take his game up another notch. And when you think about the two or three year window that this will be for Diggs in Houston, man, you got to love it if you're C.J. Stroud being able to play with an established player. Because everyone talks about this Texans offense last year, like they had all these weapons, and it was cool, but it wasn't that. Like Nico Collins, Tank Dill, nice players. I think Nico Collins has the opportunity to be a high end, like number two receiver, but. C.J. Stroud did it without having weapons. Now you're giving him a legitimate number one, a, a running back in Joe Mixon, who I still think is a little underrated for where he is in the thing. I believe he's still an upgrade over Singletary. Well, now it gets scary time in H-Town because the weapons are legit. The weapons are established. The weapons have won at a high level. Uh, I think C.J. Stroud games go goes through the roof. And for Josh Allen, I think this is the Buffalo Bills saying, oh, our Josh Allen is in the same class as Pat Mahomes. We're going to surround him with just some guys, and he'll elevate them. I like Josh Allen. I don't know if he's that, though. I don't know if he can elevate, like, pedestrian receivers and be like, hey, offense, we're good to go. We're going to make this happen. I don't know about that. 
I think I think Patrick Mahomes is the only guy that we should feel that way about. And that's I really I only feel that way because he did it, you know? I mean, I agree with you on that. And uh, coming from like the Pat Mahomes thing, like Andy Reid, uh, we were all in Green Bay together, and Mike Holmgren would would say this. Look, man, you give me uh, a high end quarterback with this system and some B B plus receivers, we win games. Andy Reid grew up in that system. Like I know it. I know that's how they felt. That's why they never expended first round picks on wideouts because they always felt like. It was the system and the quarterback that made the pass catcher, not the other way around. In Buffalo, you don't have the same system. And I don't know if Josh Allen, the playmaker, is ready to be that precise as a passer to help these wide receivers or like Curtis Samuel and, and Mac Collins and these guys that they have. I don't know if he's, he's going to be able to make them pop. And so unless they somehow find a young number one receiver that's like plug and play ready, man, I, I feel like this whole team is about to take a step back when it comes to the Buffalo Bills. I want to talk to you about that. I mean, in the, in the Bills defense, I think it is a good year to need a wide receiver. So maybe that's part of the thought process. Before we do that, though, I am curious just how you feel about Diggs's fit in Houston and just, you know, you mentioned Nico the way that they might pair together as well as with Tank Dell. I mean, like, it, it's obviously an explosive group. You think it complements pretty well as well? Well, Nico Collins is a – look, he's a vertical threat. He's a big body receiver. I mean, he has, he has – look, he has elite traits and characteristics. So he's one of the best athletes that you will find. What you get with Stephon Diggs is you get the polished playmaker with the dog in him. Like, he still has that underdog – dog mentality from being a fifth round pick out of Maryland, even though like when people check in high school, the top two receivers coming out in the recruiting class were Mari Cooper and then Stefan Diggs. Like that's how it was. And so he has always felt like he's been slighted in that regard. So he'll go down there. He'll have something to prove after being traded from Buffalo. And I believe their young receivers will feed off of his kind of like dog mentality, really good player. And I think CJ Stroud is the perfect quarterback to kind of deal with that because he's even killed. He understands how to kind of manage and deal with personality. I don't think it would be an issue. I think it would be a good thing for the Texans initially. I also think Joe Mixon kind of being um, a guy with that kind of Stephon Diggs temperament, kind of dog mentality, can be kind of on the line when it comes to it, but has some other stuff to prove. I think it works initially for Houston, at least through this year, maybe another year. But I think this year it certainly works. I think they've gotten a lot better on that, on that end, on that side of the ball. Houston's clearly, I mean, it's a very clear signal. They are like stepping into that short list in the AFC of teams that think they can contend. And as you said, I'm, I'm with you, man. If I had to guess, I think the Buffalo Bills are due for a step back, but you do have Josh Allen, who he might not be Patrick Mahomes, but he's about as close as, as anybody has. And on top of that, we, we do have the NFL draft. So like I said, it's, it's a perfect segue and we're mm -hmm. going to talk about receivers today. We we know if you follow the draft at all, this is a, a amazing receiver class. I count, I don't know, I could you could convince me that there are nine guys capable of going in the first round of the draft. I'm not saying that that's how many will get named, but I wouldn't be shocked. It's it's that good of a class. So, I want to walk through the big ones with you. Mm -hmm. We do have to start with the big three, but I think ev everybody's pretty familiar with Marvin Harrison, Malik Neighbors, and Roma Dunze right now. But I would be curious for your pecking order as we head into the draft on those three guys. Uh, I think a lot of it depends on team and what you need. Uh, I think if we talk about generic order. Uh, I think generic order, no team involved. I think Malik. I think I think you would go Marvin Harrison Jr., then Malik Neighbors, and then Roma Dunze. We kind of go in that order. The reason why Marvin Harrison Jr. would go is because, um, look, man, he he's as polished as they come. He is a true number one. He can do anything and everything that you want to see. And without being cute, um, it's the family business. You know what you're getting. Dad, Hall of Fame player. He's been as good as you can imagine uh, a kid being going to Ohio State. And then when you think about what Ohio State has produced, like they haven't missed when it comes to wide receivers. Like their guys go into the league and they play and they play well right away. Malik Neighbors is a different animal than Marvin Harrison Jr. because Marvin Harrison Jr. isn't fast 
That's why I always kind of compare him to Larry Fitzgerald, but he's effective. Malik Neighbors is a different animal. He got the juice. He has stop-start quickness, terrific with the ball in his hands. You talk to people down at LSU, as you are familiar with, they tell you, man, he is the dog. And I made the mistake. Jerry Sullivan was down there working with the wide receivers at LSU, and I put out a top five one time, and I didn't have Justin Jefferson as one of the guys when he was there. And he's like, you're wrong. You can figure out how wrong you are. And so now whenever I get that stuff from LSU, I'm like, all right. They tell me Malik Neighbors is the dog. Brian Thomas is the gifted one, but Neighbors is the dog. And so he is legit. And so he's there. And in, in Roma Dunze, it's funny because I liken him to Jamar Chase in terms of just being a rugged receiver that just wins the 50-50 ball, just kind of overwhelms you with his physicality and toughness. High IQ guy can play multiple spots. Um, the route running isn't as precise as some of the other guys, but the playmaking is. And so all those guys, I think, in the right situation, they're going to flourish. But Harrison Jr., Neighbors, and Adunze would kind of be the ranking for me at the end of it. You very famously, back in 2020, when we were working together covering the Cowboys, you mocked C.D. Lamb to the Cowboys at 17, and you caught a lot of hell for it because people were like, how in the world will C.D. Lamb fall that far? I'm curious, and I... I not, I mean, it's not a knock on any of these guys, but we just know, you know, drafts can be weird. Teams target certain players, mm -hmm. stuff happens. I'm curious, like, do you see all three of these guys as definitive top 10 or like, what is the floor for where all three of them are off the board? I think like that year, there, there was another position that kind of led to a run. So this year, there are two positions that could kind of alter the first round the wide receivers, and then I would say the offensive tackle. Because wide receivers are so plentiful and there's so many good ones, you talked about nine guys potentially carrying first-round grades. Well, what happens in the draft room, guys will look at the position groups. Okay, I got my offensive tackles. I got my wide receivers. What's the difference between the lowest offensive tackle in Tier 1 and the top tackle in Tier 2? They'll do the same thing with wide receivers. And the lines are probably blurrier with the wide receivers than the offensive tackles. And so if you have to have each of those positions, grab the best offensive tackle early, get a wide receiver late, and that could impact the way the wide receivers come off the board, not because of their talent, but because of the nature of the draft and the pool. You may go and get the big early and come back and get the playmaker later because we've seen the second round and third round wide receivers have success right away. It's harder to find the offensive tackle that is drafting on day T that has the success of the first round. That's my thought as well. Like between all of these quarterbacks and then, you know, five or six of these offensive tackles, I still, I mean, we're thinking all three of these guys are gone before like pick 15, probably still. Like, yeah, I, I would, would say so. so, but like, I, I always laugh. Cause like, it sounds silly in the lead up and everybody thinks all three of these guys are going to be gone in the top 10 and maybe they will be, I, I'm not saying it's impossible, but like, yeah, like you said, the weirdness of the draft and the way teams target things. I think that's always something worth keeping in mind. Okay. So we all draw a line there. Marv Malik, mm -hmm. Roma Dunze. I am very curious. It doesn't seem anywhere near as clear after those three. So I'm going to let you take it wherever you want. Let's just say like the next three or four receivers. Who 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 do you love the most after those three are off the board? Uh, it's so, man, it's so hard because like now you have to kind of get into, we got to categorize them in outside and inside receivers. So outside, I got Brian Thomas Jr. Like we talked about him being gifted. I talked to the LSU people. They said, man, the game is so easy for him. The light just kind of went on this year because he finally started matching the work with the gifts. And so that's why the talent exploded, even though he's playing on the other side of Malik Neighbors. Super talented, those things. I think the, the, in, in a weird way, his success depends on where he goes. It reminds me a lot of not saying player, but like T. Higgins. Like T. Yeah. Higgins wants to get paid as a free agent as a number one, but everyone is like, but is he really a number one? Or is he a high end two? So that's how I feel about Brian Thomas. Like, it's easy to say, oh, Malik Neighbors is the number one. I know your numbers dwarf him in touchdowns or whatever, but make no mistake, he's the anchor. You're more the complement 
to it. So you have that. And then you got um, – it's so weird because everyone transfers so much. A.D. Mitchell from Texas is mm -hmm. intriguing because he's a super athlete, super fast, um, puts it down. He played opposite Xavier Worthy, who I don't think Xavier Worthy is a first-round pick. Xavier Worthy, to me, is a perfect complement as a vertical stretch guy. Right. You have the established possession receiver. Xavier Worthy plays on the other side. He takes the top off the defense. You throw it to the other guy underneath. When Worthy touches it, he's going to average 18 yards a catch because it's like big plays, shot zone, down after down after down. A.D. Mitchell has that big play ability because he has the speed and the juice, but he's more likely to turn into a number one than Worthy, in my, in my opinion. So those guys are there. If you look inside, like after those guys, I think then you begin to talk about Lad McConkey. Where does Lad McConkey come in? Because he's an outstanding route runner, uh, high IQ, super competitive and feisty, can run after the catch. People sleep on him for whatever reason. Um, he's in that conversation. Um, we're in the second round now, but he's in the conversation. Ricky Pearsall from Florida in the conversation as a slot receiver that can get busy. A lot of people love Malachi Corley because he can run routes and make plays over the middle. And then you have, going back outside, Keon Coleman. Because I'm trying to figure out, what do we do with Keon Coleman? The wait, wait, where, where, do you, where do you fall on the Keon Coleman debate? Let's Out of Florida State, for anybody that's not familiar, big catch radius, circus highlights all over the place, a lot of question about his ability to separate. Bucky, what, what do you think? Uh, to me, he grades out as a second-round player. Um, big physical, acrobatic catches. Just catches everything, man. Just takes it off the rim. Probably an unbelievable basketball player in high school. Just just, just wins 50-50 balls left and right. Uh, four six one scares you just because, hey, oof, that speed, is he going to be able to separate? You don't necessarily see it in his play being an issue, but then when you think about, okay, he's going to have to take on some of these corners. Like, hey, how is he going to get away from sauce when sauce, sauce is locked up in him? Uh, if someone plays off but squats on his routes like Trayvon Diggs likes to, does he have the the quickness to be able to get away? To me, that's the biggest issue, which is why of those nine or whatever that we talk about, to me, he's more near the bottom of the nine than the top of the nine, just because big body, physical, great hands, but I just don't know if he can separate consistently. And I think that's um, – I mean, it's funny because if a guy like Keon Coleman goes – to the right play. I mean, we talk so much about fit. If he winds up playing with a quarterback who mm -hmm. can put it on a dime and he doesn't need to separate, then I think he could have a phenomenal career. But when you talk about that, I think there are plenty of teams where it's like, do we have the guy that's going to make him a plus player? You know? Yeah. Um, not only the guy, but do we have the system? Do we know how to create opportunities for those guys to get open? Can Keon Coleman become a Marcus Colston where he's the big slot receiver? Can he do the Michael Thomas stuff, go on the slide and work over the middle field? Or is he a guy that just has to play on the outside? Because if he only plays on the outside, now he gets all of the nastiness when it comes to press coverage. He gets all of the nose-to-nose -nose stuff. You can't help him by scheming up free releases and those things. So I worry about him the most of those wide receivers just because to me the speed the speed is an issue. And if he doesn't have elite speed, how is he going to consistently get open? Okay, I'm gonna go back a minute because this is something I think is is interesting. Like Brian Thomas Jr. out of LSU, I I can tell you, you know, his weaknesses, like pick, you know, maybe route running, maybe consistency, maybe the fact that he played in the same offense as Malik Neighbors. I get that. Mm -hmm. I get that Xavier Worthy is 160 pounds, and that's always going to scare the hell out of NFL evaluators. Mm -hmm. What I don't know, Adonai Mitchell, the other Texas receiver who you just talked about, what is the big weakness that keeps him from being a more talked about player? Because I'm not, I'm not saying he's Marv Harrison Jr., but he does. I mean, he seems to be the total package when you talk about speed, explosiveness, production, route running. But he doesn't get talked about that way, and I would love to know why. Yeah, he's just super cool. Um, I don't know why he's flown on the radar. Maybe because there's so many wide receivers in so many different spots, inside, outside. I mean, I can go on this long dissertation on why I believe Lab McConkey and Ricky Pierce are going to absolutely smash it 
at the slot receiver. Then you have the top three at the top where we just go crazy thinking about which one of these guys is going to be the next Jamar Chase or all of those great guys that have been drafted. Um, A.D. Mitchell flies on the radar, I think maybe because we, we, we've we heard about him for so long. We saw him at Georgia. He kind of just dis- disappears, pops up in Texas, but you like, Okay, what do we what do we do with it? You hear, right. hey man, Texas got a wide receiver, but you're like, well, which one is it? Is it Mitchell? Is it Worthy? Worthy runs fast, so he's just had the unfortunate luck of just being kind of viewed as a complimentary piece, even though his game and his athletic traits suggest that he should be much more than that. You mentioned him a minute ago, and I, I, you, you talked about him, but I'm curious for a, a bigger picture. Actually, spoiler alert: he's a guest on the NFL on Fox podcast. What can you tell me about Lad McConkey? You see him as a slot guy at the next level. I I'm in love with this dude's potential. And I, I always, I get excited about guys that like are on the fringe of like the, the bottom of the first round, early second mm-hmm. round, because in my mind, I'm like, Oh, you have a shot to wind up on a good team in a good system. And that is going to unlock your potential. Debo Samuel is a great example of a guy mm-hmm. who like, he, he went just late enough that a great team like the 49ers snatched him up and we saw what happened. Like, what do you see as, as the fit for Lad McConkey and, and what he might be doing at the next level? Uh, Lad McConkey is a high IQ guy who can fit in anywhere. Um, haven't had an opportunity to talk to him recently, man. This dude just gets balled in a major way. Uh, he talks about having to prove himself at Georgia. Everything was earned. How he learned route running, the art of route running as a collegiate. I think that's the thing that separates him from most guys. This guy knows how to get open. He knows how to use his balance and body control, stop, start quickness to create separation. To me, he's a fit in, in really any offense. But what I want to do is I want to spread it out and allow him to go to work over the middle of the field because I think he's going to overwhelm nickels and dimes that are not used to dealing with someone who has the quickness and the burst that also has the strength to kind of fight through some of those jams and whatever to get open over the middle of the field. Um, teams we talked about, I know people will talk about like the Buffalo Bills needing one. Um, I don't know if they're presently constructed would need one like that. Um, I could see him being a nice fit with the L.A. Chargers, top of the second mm-hmm. round, not only because of what he brings, but the toughness tough guy willing to blog willing to engage and do a bunch of different things so i can see him that friends bottom of the first round top of the second round here he is his name fall for any bills fans that are trying to process the stefan diggs trade is do you have somebody in mind it could be first round it could be later if you want but just in general like i have to believe buffalo is going to target a receiver is there a guy in this class that you think makes a ton of sense there uh, at 28, man, it, 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 the board could be kind of, I don't want to say pick clean from the good, but it, they could have some guys that are sitting there. I think it's hard, man, because Stefan Diggs leaves such a huge void. Um, you got to kind of get them to think about it differently. When they brought Curtis Samuel over, it kind of takes away the slot receiver because that's what he, I would anticipate doing. Uh, I think you need someone who can play on the outside and win and win and win. Uh, to me, you know, we, we had the conversation about K- Coleman kind of being one of those guys that can go on the outside and win. Uh, I think A.D. Mitchell, though, might be the pick because of the juice. Mm-hmm. I think I can see him being a guy that's versatile enough to play inside and outside with the juice that you're looking for um, to separate him from the rest of the crew. I looked this up earlier this week. The Bills have they have two fourth round picks, two fifth round picks, and two sixth round picks. It's very easy to imagine Brandon Bean. Not like I think it's silly to suggest the Bills are gonna like jump into the top ten. But yeah, if getting to twenty three lands them an Adonai Mitchell or maybe a Brian Thomas Jr., yeah, like that that wouldn't surprise me at all. Yeah, and I think that's a doable deal because I I don't know how many people – we always mock draft a bunch of receivers. I don't know how many executives feel the same that we feel about their class. Like, Is that right? Uh, I mean, Bucky, this is why you're the GOAT. Like, tell me more. Are we overrating the class? I think so. When we talk about it being a great class, I wouldn't necessarily categorize it as great. I would categorize it as, as deep 
And I think this is part of a systemic thing that is going on. So it's been about a decade since we've seen the explosion of seven on seven football. Yep. Right. And it's been about a little more than a decade where every offense in high school has gone to the spread. So what we're seeing at the high school levels, high school coaches are taking their three best athletes and put them at wide receiver. And so those guys are touching the ball, they're training, they're running routes from the time that they're like 15. I mean, like even beyond that 13, 14, 15, playing these seven on seven tournaments or whatever. So you're getting a more skilled, better athlete at wide receiver. But because the draft is a draft, all of those skilled players can't go in the first round. And we're not overvaluing what they're coming, what's coming to the league, but we are getting a better product for the day two selections. We're getting players that are really good, really talented, to kind of fit that B-plus mode that we were talking about. And guys are like, look, they're investing in the second-round receiver as opposed to the first-round receiver. And if wide receivers aren't careful, they could suffer a similar fate to running backs where you see a handful of guys making big money, like $30 million, and then everybody else is, is bargain basement shopping like the Green Bay Packers are. I think I I think it's one of the most interesting subplots in football right now. I I I think you're totally right. Of like, I mean, wide receiver is still one of the most important positions in football. Like we've seen what these guys can do for their teams, but there are more great ones than there have ever been. I mean, we're every year you can count on two of these guys being like Pro Bowl caliber. Every year you can count on a day two or day three pick hitting the ground running, whether it's Puka Nakua, whether it's Amon Ross St. Brown, Mm -hmm. like it, it's just, you can kind of set your watch to it. And yeah, I'm, I'm fascinated. I think that's a different conversation for a different day, but yeah, like Justin Jefferson, CD lamb, Jamar chase, like those guys are probably going to get those big extensions, but if you're not in that rarefied air, I don't know if NFL teams are going to be comfortable signing $30 million paychecks, knowing that all this talent is just, you know, funneling into the league. Yeah, no, I think, I think you're really on to something. Um, People are looking around and you're looking at the success and no one will admit it. Everyone is fascinated by what the green Bay Packers were able to do last year. Here we go. We're ready to write them off. They don't have a quarterback. They don't have any wide receivers. There's no way this offense is going to work. And what did they do? They had a different receiver lead the team in receiving yards every month. And Jordan Love looked like a superstar. And none of us expected Jordan Love to look like a superstar, given the small sample size that we had on him as a as look as as a as a pro. He didn't do anything. He had a game versus Kansas City or whatever. So now you see this young quarterback surrounded by all these playmakers that are getting busy. All over the field, Jaden Reed, and Terry Witt, like, I mean, just on and on and on. Ramir Dobbs, and so Puka Nakua also pops for the Rams. You're going to have more people say, "Hey, let's investigate this a little bit. What is the difference between the first rounders and the guys that are carrying the second and third round grades? Is it a big difference? There's so many of them. Maybe we double up, take one in the second, take one in the fourth, and see which one pops. I think you will see more." decision makers make those kinds of decisions as opposed to, Hey, I'm gonna go up and just get one of these marquee guys. So two questions off of that one. And we kind of talked about it with the big guys up at the top, but like across the first round, is it possible that that line of thinking pushes some of these guys down? Like, again, it's hard to Mm -hmm. imagine right now that Brian Thomas jr. Is sitting there in the twenties, but if enough teams value different positions above it, you can't rule anything out. I 100% can can see him being right there and available in the twin. Um, I thought that, like 18 might be the sweet spot given T. Higgins and Tyler Boyd, you know, like the Bengals needing another guy to kind of come in and play because that's what they've always done. Um, but you have other uh, uh, teams that are looking and be like, you know, do I need a corner? Do I need a DB? Or obviously, man, I can get a DB anywhere. Let me – let me get that later. Let me make sure I get uh, – so it, it, it changes um, the value and those things. But, yeah, I think the the depth of the wide receiver position is better than it's ever been, even though I would say the high-end talent isn't, like, the, the, the most impressive class that we've seen or whatever. Really good players. Um, 
I don't know how many like elite level pass catches we're talking about when we talk about those day two categories. Okay, so next question is if that's the case, do you have an idea of where the sweet spot is? Like for instance, you know, you might you feel great about, you know, we're like, oh, we're picking 65th in the second round, or you know, we're picking 65th and we feel great about our options there, but where do you kind of start to not feel good about your options? Like where does the depth of this class kind of start to run out? I think the depth of the entire draft drops, falls off the cliff after the third round. Like after that last week, it's it's over it. For the wide receivers, normally we always see anywhere from like 15 to 18 go the first two days. I think you see that same number. Uh, It's a cheaper, more effective model. And because Owners are always looking to build teams on the cheap. All these young players having success right away will only encourage more teams to they, you know, to, to to go that route. Like seeing a Puka Nakua, seeing a Cooper Cup, seeing um Amara St. St. Brown, all those guys. We talked about what, second, third, fourth, fifth yeah. round. Their success stories are gonna make people pause a little bit before they jump into the first round just to take a first round receiver. That is, it's, it's fat. It's, it's very interesting to think about. Cause like, I still, like I said, eight, nine names that make sense, but depending on how teams feel, I mean, what, what do you think is the minimum in the first round? Like four probably. Yeah. Yeah. I think four, I think the last one to go is, is four. I think at a minimum, Brian Thomas goes in the first round. I think the, the possibles, if we are playing a game of spades, the possibles would, would, would center around, A.D. Mitchell, Lad McConkey. Uh, I don't see Xavier Worthy in there, but maybe my scout buddy will kind of put it up there. But those, those are the guys that I see. The big four, then maybe two more, and everyone else is a feed and frenzy. Fair enough. Okay. Let's take it, let's take it back to our days doing draft podcasts. Mm-hmm. You know, you know the phrase I'm about to use. <laughs> Pick it. Who's your pet cat? And it it can't be it can't be somebody that's gonna go in the top like sixty picks. That doesn't count. Can't be someone that goes in the top sixty picks. So I need to find the pet cat at wide receiver that goes outside of it. So let's go. Family business knows how the business operates. Kind of showed out doing the All Star circuit. Uh, let's go with Luke McCaffrey. Ooh, let's go with Luke okay. McCaffrey. Let's go with Luke McCaffrey being a guy that is gonna surprise, uh, in a way. So Luke McCaffrey gets all of the benefits of uh, his people going through the league and having success. He's seen Christian do it. We talk about easy Ed McCaffrey doing it. We've seen others find their way to practice squads and those things. So he already knows what he's stepping into. And then when you look at him play at Rice and you see the, the success that he was able to have and the highlight catches and the splash plays, and you know that he's going to have the right temperament, I would say just keep an eye on Luke McCaffrey is one of those guys that makes it and makes it better than than some people would make it. That's you said family business, and I was like, okay, we're gonna talk some Brendan Rice here. And then you threw a curveball at me. Mm. I am that first of all, that I mean that that's a great tip, Luke McCaffrey. But as long as it's on my brain, what do you think about the son of Jerry Rice? So man, we had a fascinating time, right? In terms of just like so many sons, Frank Gore Jr. being a running back coming in. We, we've got all these guys that you either played with or you scouted. They, their sons are now entering the league. Uh, Brendan Wright, I think he has the talent. And the thing about it is he carries his dad's name, but he doesn't carry, I would say, all of the weight that normally is associated with that. He's been able to kind of grow up in his own spotlight, create his own buzz and do that. When you see him, he certainly has the gifts to be able to get it done. You know that he has been equipped uh, from his dad in terms of being them talking about, hey, man, understand how to do this, how to go about it, working or whatever. I think he's literally just about to get the opportunity. Like, where does he stack when it comes to a good player? Um, it'll be interesting to see where he goes. I think day three. I mean, with this many available receivers, I, th- I mean, even going day three, I guess I'm trying to say I I don't think that's necessarily a knock when there's this many options. No, available. I mean like no, just look. I mean I'm telling you, man. Like Puka Nakua is going to be the story where everyone because everyone is going to go into the draft because you you know we're so reactionary, right? 
We're so reactionary, Scal. Something happens one year, well, oh, I got to go right back and find that thing. This year, there are going to be so many wide receivers drafted in the fifth and sixth round that everyone is going to kind of throw their flag at, like, hey, this is our, this is the Puka Nakua. They're going to look for the, the older, experienced guy that kind of has a, a maybe got nicked up, maybe has some injuries, but the talent was there. You're absolutely right. Day three is going to be bananas because so many people are going to be chasing ghosts. I, I mean, I hear you, but it is the thing that, that brings me back though. And you're totally right. Like everybody, everybody overreacts and over corrects. But like we said, it is, it is somewhat sustainable. Obviously I can't guarantee that your team is going to be the team that finds the guy, but mm-hmm. that guy is probably out there. Like that plus starter that you're going to find like round three, round four, round five, like it, it is it is starting to become a somewhat normal thing. One hundred percent, it's normal, and it should be normal because it, we always talk about it, right? And the, the other show that we used to be on, where we talk about draft and develop, right? We want to draft and we want to develop them, but that takes a full commitment. It takes a commitment from the front offices that, hey, man, we're committed to drafting the best guy. We take the best athlete and and do and and do something unique with them and we're going to teach them how to play and do all that that's what the indianapolis coast are doing if you look at their draft last year they took all the prototypes all the athletic outliers they did that and then they're putting it on the coaching staff to develop them on the grass wide receiver you're going to see similar things hey man i don't need the fastest guy give me the guy with some juice some change of direction some quickness and i'm gonna be willing to do that but you got to have the right coaches and one of the things that a general manager has to do he not only has to scout the players, he has to scout the coaches and see which guys are great evaluators, which guys are great young player developers, and make sure that if you're going to go the draft and develop route, that you're putting those guys in rooms with masterful teachers so they can maximize their talent. It's going to be so fun to watch. I mean, I'm I'm sticking I'm sticking to it. I'm I'm saying I'm saying five or six receivers go in the first round. And I, I think needs going to play a part of it. I think talent's going to play a part of it. I do think we're going to hear a decent number of names, but also it's going to be so much fun to see how this all falls and which ones of these guys step up with their opportunity. I know it's going to happen. Buck. I, I always love talking with you, man. I, trust me, we will do it again. We still got a few weeks to go before the draft. So we'll bring you back and, ask you some questions about another position soon. Hey man, appreciate it. It's always fun. Appreciate you, brother. Thanks again to Bucky for coming on. Always love our conversations. That does it for the show today. Plenty more content coming your way though. On Friday, a conversation with another intriguing 2024 draft prospect, Alabama edge rusher, Chris Braswell dropped by the show. Talk about his draft process, the Alabama pedigree, where he thinks he's going, everything in between. Make sure you're subscribed on Spotify, on Apple Podcasts, wherever you get them to hear that conversation, as well as plenty more content coming your way next week and in the weeks leading up to the NFL Draft. I know I say it a lot, but it is approaching rapidly. We are inside of a month, just about three weeks until things kick off in Detroit. So keep up with all the latest here. Plenty more interviews coming your way with Chris Braswell as well as others. So keep tuned right here. We appreciate it. I will talk to you all real soon.